Good evening. My name is Brent Almanera. I'm a 2022-2023 Poetry Coalition Fellow. During my 10-month tenure, I'm assisting Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. Welcome to season two of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. Letras Latinas is under the direction of Francisco Aragon, who served as MC for season one, a season whose episodes undertook deep dives into debut books, where each first book poet selected their own interlocutor. For season two, we're telling a different story, a transatlantic story, one that will feature conversations between U.S. Latinx poets and British Latinx poets, respectively. Francisco Aragon and British Latinx poet Leo Boix are the co-artistic directors of the series, with additional assistance from British Latinx literary activist Natalie Teitler, who co-directs Un Nuevo Sol, our presenting partner in the UK. Yours truly will serve as MC. Season two is made possible thanks to a grant from the Poetry Foundation and the collaboration of the Writer Center in Bethesda, Maryland, who, once again, is our host and co-presenter alongside Poet Lore. Special thanks to Zach Powers of the Writer Center for his crucial behind the scenes assistance. Tonight, we are sharing the first episode of the season, one which will present a conversation between Janelle Pineda and Maya Elsner. In this episode, Janelle and Maya discuss their books, Lineage of Rain and Overrun by Wild Boars respectively. In their captivating exchange, Maya and Janelle discuss visiting each other's countries and how travel has influenced their work. In this truly global conversation, their joy and friendship are palpable as they discuss writing in traditional form, uncovering motifs, and tapping into memories and family history when writing poetry. Enjoy. Hello. Hi, Maya. Hi, Janelle. <laughs> how are you doing? I am well. How are you? It's great to so, see you. Yeah, so happy to be speaking with you today. Um, I was wondering, maybe we could just begin by remembering how we met. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we have, yeah, you know, such a such a special memory. Um, we met at the launch of the Un Nuevo Sol anthology in London in November 2019. Um, and it was so lovely to... Um, get to connect with you there. I remember hearing you um, read your poetry for the first time and feeling like I must go up to this person and tell them how great their work is. <laughs> you know what? And that whole um, meeting with you was so special because it was actually the first time I had read my work in public. And so then when you um, came up to me afterwards and I just thought, oh my God, Janelle, I know you're going to be one of my best friends. Um, so that was so special. And I was also just remembering that actually we were together. Um, when was it? It must have been March 2020. Yes. About to do a reading um, to think about Che Guevara's legacy and the motorcycle diaries right the day when Boris Johnson shut down all theatres. And I remember we were right in the middle. We were in the changing room, both of us. And I have this kind of very vivid memory because we were talking, I think, about the difference between, you know, like the connections between UK and US Latinx experience and the difference in our growing up. And it was one of those like, so, you know, conversations full of energy and kind of excitement. And then and then someone who worked at the theatre came in and said, we're telling everyone to go home. This event is not going to happen. So it feels like that moment was also such a kind of charged, strange moment together, um, right at the kind of end of something and the beginning of beginning of something else. Um, so just, yeah, also thinking about that. <laughs> no, absolutely. I feel like it was such a unique time, right? Yeah. Um, and being now, you know, Three, almost three years out from that, it's um, kind of wild to look back and, and think about those moments um, that were filled with such deep uncertainty, right? We didn't know what was going on, um, but I think it has been, you know, really beautiful to like 
you know, maintain our relationship and to, to be such good friends and to get to be having this conversation today too. Yes. Yeah, completely. And I guess maybe um, just like following on from that, I wondered, you know, you've spent so much time in the UK actually, because you've now done two years as a Marshall Scholar and one year kind of separated, right? By by a year um, because, of, because of the pandemic back in the US. Um, and I was just wondering... I'd love to hear how you experienced Latinx community in the UK, what it meant to you, um, maybe how how your expectations were different than than what kind of what happened. I'd love to know a little bit about how your experience was in the UK. Absolutely. Um, so I first went to the UK in um, 2016. I was studying abroad as part of my undergraduate degree. And I remember kind of being faced with this choice about my study abroad experience where um, I was picking between the UK and a program in South America and people kept saying, well, you know, your work is so invested in Latin American history and memory. Um, why go to England? Right. <laughs> and at the time it was a decision that I kind of just jumped into and wasn't as um, sure what I would find. Um, but I had the great fortune of, um, befriending a really lovely Salvadoran family and finding home and community with them there. Um, and so, you know, that kind of made me realize like, you know, I love the UK. I have connections to people here. Um, and so I decided to go back. Right. And I knew I wanted to be in London um, where we met because London's such an exciting city. I think there's so much going on, particularly in terms of the literary communities there. Um, and what I found, um, especially because I was living um, right by Elephant and Castle, was that there was this, you know, growing um, and sizable Latinx community um, that I immediately felt at home with in a, in a kind of way. I remember, you know, being able to pick up um, like Dominican pastelitos on my way to class, you know, and um stopping by La Chatica, the Colombian cafe, right? And getting, you know, to, to have familiar foods um, and really having those connections has been so beautiful. I think particularly meeting you and um, the other writers in Un Nuevo Sol was so special because it was connecting with other people who also shared a love for for poetry, for, for creative work. Um, so I think that's, that's all been really beautiful and lets me kind of challenge this narrative that there are no um, people of Latin American descent in the UK. I so, love that. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I love that you mentioned Elephant and Castle because I also, I used to live like 20 minutes away and I would just take this 343 bus to and from Elephant Castle, which was basically a Spanish speaking bus. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I, I love just thinking about you in that space. So thank you for that memory. Absolutely. And, you know, I think another thing that's super unique about our experiences is we've kind of had the swap where um, I, you know, grew up in the U.S., but, um, you know, did my studies in the U.K. Um, and you are currently completing your MFA in creative writing at Michigan. Um, so I'd love to hear about um, how you've experienced the Latinx community in the U.S. Um, and yeah, just what that experience has been like. Yeah, totally. Um so I actually first, I mean, I, I'm in Michigan now and I have been here for a year and a half, but before then in 2017, I actually was in Boston and that was the first time I was kind of um, in the US for an extended period of time. Um, I'd come to kind of think about prison abolition and um, study with some activists here and um, with about the criminal justice system in general. Um, and the interesting thing about that moment in Boston is I found myself kind of in the midst of a, many recently arrived Latin American students and immigrants um, from kind of Puerto Rico and Boston and um, Mexico and the Dominican Republic and Colombia. Um, so a little bit like your experience, so much of our time was spent just kind of wandering Jamaica Plains and finding ceviche or just going to the little bodegas. And um, I just remember those as such spaces of extraordinary laughter and joy and, um, and also discussion of difference. And I think it was so interesting because actually what I found at least in that moment was that the conversation around Latin America in the US felt so different from the one in the UK and I think partly it was because 
you know, Latin America is so, so much closer <laughs> than in the UK. So there's that kind of um, proximity. But also, um, I think it's also because of the history of US intervention in, for instance, Central America, and um, also the particular rhetoric around Mexico and Mexicanness um, in 2017, which was obviously like years of Donald Trump being in power. Um, and it was just kind of really fascinating and also complicated to think about the different perceptions and constructions. And I think I've always been really, I was just talking to a friend um, kind of last week um, who's from Bolivia and she was talking, she did this big trip in around Europe and she was actually talking about how the di her, the different um, reactions to her in, in France versus Portugal versus Spain versus the UK. Um, so it was kind of very interesting to be in the US in that moment where I was, you, you know, where these things were really being talked about. Um, but all that to say, the time I spent, you know, alongside um, Latin Americans and Latin American diasporic people was just so beautiful. And as you said, it just felt a little bit like a home away from home. And um, I'll never forget those special moments um, of bachata and salsa. I think a dance was very important also during that time. <laughs> Um, but one thing I was really kind of curious about is also how um, your time in the UK um, has kind of affected your writing. I mean, did it affect your writing? I would love to know. No, thank you for that. And it's it's beautiful to hear your reflections. I think um, I certainly relate in the elements of like arts and culture being a really important unifying aspect of um, you know, coming together with other um, Latinx folks. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that writing in particular is really, um, or, or thinking about my the impact of um, being in the UK on my writing, I um, had just signed the contract for my chapbook when I moved to London. So I was definitely, yeah, <laughs> you're so sweet. I was definitely, you know, um, thinking about what it would look like to put together that collection while I was there. Um, and part of what um, I think a lot of my work was engaging is kind of how do I grapple with the imperial legacies, right, of, of even the English language. And that's something that I'd, you know, written about in my poetry before, um, but kind of took on a new element being in the UK. Um, you know, I, I have a poem where I write about my grandmother singing a Beatles song. Um, and that comes from, you know, growing up, I remember I asked my grandmother once, Grandma, what's your favorite song? And she said, oh, you know, esa canción de, del chucho cansado, of the tired dog, right? Which is a hard day's night. It was so funny because I asked her that question, expecting her to tell me like a salsa or cumbia song, right? Um, and so then kind of recognizing how um, the UK and, you know, the US have shared some of, you know, these, you know, broader influences um, on Latin America and certainly in my experience. Um, so some of it was, you know, grappling with those questions. And I think the other part of being in the UK was just, I think London is such a beautiful city for literary community, just the amount of, you know, um, literary events and readings and workshops and things that you can participate in um, is just incredible. So, yeah, I'm curious because I know that you first started writing a poetry when you were in the U.S. So I wonder if you could tell us more about what that experience was like for you. Yeah, totally. And but I'm so glad you brought up your um, your chat book because I, I feel so honored that I saw an early version of that before it even went to publication. And um, yeah, that poem that you have about your grandma and about the Beatles is just so moving and so special to me. So um, I'm so glad it's in this conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, as you said, I started writing poetry in the US and um, one thing that just immediately struck me was um, that in the US, you can kind of count on a bilingual audience or at least an audience, a really big audience of people who are comfortable kind of in Spanish and between Spanish. And um, for me, that was kind of, it was, it was actually just this extraordinary moment was like, where I was like, whoa, I could write in a language that is like the language of my home and the language of intimacy for me. Um, because I think partly, 
um, you know, in my household growing up, um, my dad doesn't speak Spanish. Um, but when he's um, with my mom, he actually reverts back to the English his parents used to speak. Um, and they were Polish refugees. So it's kind of a very beautiful language of like vivid expressive expression, but kind of not necessary, you know, um, standard grammatical correctness was not what was happening in, in my home. And um, my grandfather actually spoke um, first Polish, then French, because he lived as an asylum speaker for, um, sorry, asylum seeker for 10 years and then English. So it was also a language of all these kind of imported syntactical constructions. Um, and so I just thought, you know, being in the US where you can have Spanglish, where people flip between it so, so, so seamless, seamlessly, um, I just thought, wow, this, this can be a language. I, I can now speak in a language that is closer to, to to what what feels tender and what feels intimate for me. And that was really liberating. And I think when I returned to the UK, I had to actually think um, how not that many people speak Spanish. You know, your audience is much smaller. And what does that mean? And um, what would it mean for kind of poems to be, if, to have words in Spanish that that are not, you know, that, that are unfamiliar? Because I think actually the number of native Spanish speaking in the UK is 0.2% or something like that. So kind of a really small number compared to the US. Um, so I think that was kind of an interesting, um, yeah, just an interesting difference. And it's something that made me think, think a lot. Um, but I was wondering whether maybe we could, um, I could ask you a question about your pamphlet, if you're happy with that. Absolutely. Um <laughs> I, I can't even tell you how much I love this book. Um, it's just so heartbreaking and so beautiful and so tender and all these moments of kind of um, thinking about history and memory and trauma um, and, and what we inherit as well. Um, so I was kind of one thing, I'm always just so fascinated by the stories that are passed down through the generations. And in Rain, um, the speaker, who's a little girl, <laughs> asks Tana why she left El Salvador and Tana answers, um, porque allá mucho llueve. And the speaker understands from this answer that every time it rains, it is time to flee. Um, and later on, the speaker says, a Salvadoran woman once wrote, our poetry has never had the luxury of being enamored with the moon. Perhaps this is why all my poems are about the sun. Um, and that just kind of made me think about how rain mixes with sun to create a rainbow. Obviously, this chapbook is called The Lineage of Rain. Um, and it seems to me that this poem is kind of making a claim about possibility, about the possibility when you bring rain and sun together. And I was just wondering whether you could speak to the symbolism of rain and sun in this in this pamphlet. Oh, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, you know, interestingly, water emerged unintentionally as a recurring theme. It's not something I was aware of really until I had kind of taken a step back after putting the manuscript together. Um, and some of what I realized was um, just how, as a metaphor, it allowed me to talk about the complexities of you know, of migrating, of living in diaspora, of, um, you know, navigating systems of power in these ways. Um, so, you know, the, the first poem um, after the poem in the collection is um, rain, right? And kind of tracing um, the lineages that I've come from in terms of Salvadoran women's resistance, specifically the women in my family, um, and then the final poem in the collection um, is called um, And It Is Green. Um, and I toyed with that title for a while. I'm glad I kept it as it is. But um, for a while, I really wanted to call it After the Rain. Um, because what do we need in order for things to grow? You know, um, and the the final poem is kind of imagining this like futuristic um, utopia, right? where everything is green and beautiful and I'm there with my mom and it's, it's great. Um, but recognizing the hardship and maybe the work that has to go into that and letting rain, you know, kind of represent that. Um, so that's definitely a, a big theme that I think the poems taught me something I always tell people is the poems are smarter than we are. Um, uh, and though that was, a very particular instance where I realized like these poems are telling me something that, you know, isn't even at the conscious level for me, but that is, you know, so integral to the work. Uh, 
So I'm moving to chat about your work. I have your book here too. Oh, I love it so much. And <laughs> I keep it, I keep it here um, on my like desk um, at bedside table. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, similarly about how you came to your title. So the title of your collection, Overrun by Wild Boars, um, is first alluded to in your poem, Pilgrims, right? In which you write, wild boars overrun my mind like pilgrims on the hunt for purpose, gold. Boars return later in the collection in your poem, Born in the Year of the Boar. And finally, the full title appears as is, In the Night Does Not Discriminate. Could you just tell us more about this motif of boars across your poetics and how you came to this title? Yeah, of course. And also, I just wanted to say, um, it's so interesting, these themes, kind of what you were saying about rain that just emerge without you knowing that they're there. And because it was exactly like that for me also, um, the kind of boars came into it really in a roundabout, like, non-planned way and I love what you said about kind of our poems being smarter than we are 100% true <laughs> um but yeah I think so the boars first arrived because I read an article um so it was back April May 2020 early early stages of um the pandemic in that very kind of terrible um terrible time um and the the article was about how these wild boars were kind of basically running through the streets and turning up in um you know, kind of turning up in public spaces. And it was really interesting because um, where where I was uh, in my parents' house, we would have, we actually had ducklings walking right in the middle of the road. Um, and we had, you know, I also read about kind of goats like hanging out in the hotels in Scotland, kind of just like in the gardens and public spaces. And it just made me think a little bit about, um, you know, what happens when humans dominate less and they take up less space and how nature flourishes in this kind of very strange, you know, also tragic time. Um, and then also a question of maybe um, we notice more when we're less occupied with ourselves. Um, but then after that, after I read the article, the boars took on kind of a completely different meaning because I'd been thinking before about our destructiveness as humans, um, human destructiveness, how we hurt ourselves, um, how we also hurt each other interpersonally and also on a societal level. Um, and of course, kind of how we hurt the environment. And I think what humans have done to land and to other humans is kind of a really big part of, of this book. And the boar was just such an interesting creature because it, it can be very aggressive um, and definitely cause harm, but it's also not a predator. So I was kind of interested in the question of like, how close are we as humans to the wild boar? Um, capable of a lot of harm, but also of love and intimacy and protection of young and um, and just kind of questions about how how we are able to kind of open, to be open ourselves and to feel tenderness in the face of what has happened of, of history and what we carry in our bodies. Um, and really interestingly, actually, um, after reading my book, someone came up to me and was saying, I think she grew up um, somewhere in Eastern Germany. And she was saying that um, in the kind of forests of her childhood, wild boars were actually radioactive because of the disaster at Chernobyl. And it was kind of so intriguing and strange to talk to her because she was just saying that obviously, you know, it's like definitely not the boar's fault that this terrible accident happened. And, you know, the questions of culpability are there, but those I can't answer. <laughs> um, but also kind of what it means that these radioactive boars are close and then they're really dangerous to, to everything, to animals, to humans. And so, again, I was kind of wondering about trauma in the body and what kind of these radioactive boars and what it is to kind of proximity create creates chaos and harm and, and what that means. Um, and kind of that actually made me think a lot about some of the poems in your um, in your chapbook, because I know that in your poem, um, Di Otoño, the speaker notices um, the word war doesn't leave his lips, but lives in how his head hangs. And there's kind of that sonic echoing of um, lives, lips. Um, and I felt like that really said something about how trauma is held in the body and um, in the lips, although, you know, in the lips, although they're not spoken, it's almost like they're on on the brink about to speak. Um, and I wondered whether you had any thoughts about the vocalization of traumatic memory in contexts where so much has been silenced or suppressed. Uh, thanks so much for, um, you know, just providing that context on boars as a, as a recurring, you know, um, image in your, in your work. It's so fascinating to hear that and to hear your, 
um, kind of reflections and insights around that. Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated, right. When these, um, images kind of, you know, allow us to engage the complexities of trauma of living. Um, so I guess turning to, to your question about, um, my poem, um, the poem is called The Otoño is Ready to Die. And even writing that title was like, oh my God, like, am I, am I saying something, you know, um, too, too heavy? Um, but I think some of it was just really trying to grapple with how the silences across um, Salvadoran histories, um, particularly in the 20th century, um, have been perpetuated through this like militarized repression um, and, you know, a very real fear um, of speaking about certain things for, for fear of your life. Um, and now being in a position where there's ongoing violence in El Salvador, but um, things have shifted, right? The violence looks, looks differently um, than, than it did years ago. Um, and yet, that kind of history of silencing is still present. Um, part of what um, I think I'm, you know, still grappling with is how we can honor the stories um, that we have lived, that our family has lived, um, while also, you know, acknowledging the the pain and and hardship of speaking those words, right? So. Um, I think there are things that you pick up on um, and certainly I think what poetry allows me to do is to slow down and to linger in those moments, right? Where there are things that are unsaid um, that can still be understood um, from a conversation. And um, it's something that I think any poet writing about um, traumatic histories and stories that you know we might not have directly experienced um, have a responsibility to be aware of, right? And to to really, you know, be intentional um, about how we write about certain things and how we, you know, choose to document those things. Um, yeah, I hope that answers a bit of, of your question. Um, I'm thinking about how um, your collection really makes use of a variety of poetic forms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have um, guzzles, villanelles, sestinas, contrapuntals. I felt like I would be turning the page and I'm like, she's so good at form. <laughs> um, I find forms to be, or traditional forms to be really helpful, um, particularly with disciplining the way that you tell a particular story. Um, so I'm curious about your relationship to poetic forms. How do you choose a particular form to, to write a poem in? Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like it really connects to what you were saying about um, how we make space to honor the pain in in experience. Um, I think with this project, it just felt like there were some things that, um, I don't know, I always feel like form has a kind of emotional language to it. Mm -hmm. And like the Sestina, for instance, which um, I don't know why I used it five times in this, you know, I, I'm a bit confused <laughs> myself, but it has, you know, it's this form that has the six repeating words that come back in each stanza in a different order. Um, and it's funny because Mimi Calvati um, has talked about kind of the Sestina being almost as if you come back to the same door every day and knock every day you knock mm -hmm. and um i think someone else said it maybe first i can't remember who who was kind of the origin of this of this phrase but i think that was really helpful in thinking about memory actually and and the circularity of memory and the way you we are haunted by memory and um and also how kind of trauma keeps you stuck and there's a kind of stuckness a difficulty in moving on um that i felt like the form really it was really encapsulating some of those dilemmas um but also each time it comes up, obviously it comes back differently. And, um, you know, a noun can become a verb or um, you break the sentence in a different way. So I think it also creates this space for the possibility of transformation or of healing or of movement or, of, you know, so I thought that was so interesting. And I was also actually really thinking about resistance in relation to you were talking about resistance um, 
by the women of your family and um, in El Salvador in general. And I, I feel like received forms are these things that we've inherited. Um, it's a kind of dialogue with history in a way. Um, but I was also thinking about the logic of empire and kind of containment. And what would it be like to use these forms to explore kind of life that cannot be contained, that will not be contained to kind of really push at the limits of kind of what has been passed down. Um, and so I use a lot of contrapuntals and partly you read them both horizontally and vertically. And for me, it was kind of an answer to that in a way where it provides a way of thinking um, about an alternative version or a counter history. And I think, you know, right right now I'm actually, um, I have a new chat book that is going to come out in September. Um, I actually am not entirely sure about the title, so I can't tell you what it is. Um, but it's a book of ekphrastic poems um, inspired by my grandfather's paintings because um, he was a Holocaust refugee who survived the Second World War um, in hiding in, in, in the forest of Poland while... Um, when all his family were kind of killed in different death camps. Um, and then later he found in painting a reason to live, a reason not to take his own life. And these poems were kind of really written in, in love and in mourning. Um, and Ekphrasis is really interesting because it's a kind of translation um, from image to text. And it was interesting because thinking about your Tio Tonio and that poem, um, it was so hard for my grandfather to speak, but in a way he did speak through his painting. And I was just thinking about kind of what is it to grapple specifically with words and poetry is so interesting because it doesn't have to have the kind of like assimilating impulse that prose does right because when we think of narrative we think you know usually it has a beginning middle and end so there's a kind of um attempt at making something comprehensible but what happened in context of war it's not comprehensible nothing's comprehensible and so it's interesting that logic it doesn't have sorry poetry doesn't have to follow through that logic but it can kind of find its own logic a logic of emotions of um of something else and i feel like that is kind of also what you were doing with that poem where um, the uncle is speaking, but he's speaking with his body, not in words, a kind of alternative to words. Um, so yeah, but anyway, but just and thinking back to translation, um, I, I just thought the one thing that's often so painful is distance. And I wonder whether um, your poems, whether they are kind of a space in which distances can make, can can be made smaller in a way. I think partly, you know, there's Spanglish and um, where English and Spanish are kind of brought side to side in a way that's of course kind of representative of diasporic experiences we were talking about before. But I think in fifth grade show and tell, um, a woman in El Salvador sings that song so loud, I hear her from my room further up the continent. Um, so that's just a quotation from the poem. And I just wonder whether the experience of writing this book has made you feel or think differently about distance or, or about home. Yeah. Um, first, I have to say, I'm over here taking notes, Maya, every time you speak, I feel like I just need to have, you know, um, a notebook ready, um, because I learned so much from you. And it's it's so beautiful to be in dialogue with you in this way. Um, when you were talking about forms, um, and how a form can contain a poem, of course, I thought about um, on not translating Neruda, right, where you write, like, you know, the mistranslation of um, you know, contains and holds and that, will he contain his lover? Will he hold his lover? Um, does the poetic form contain the poem or does it hold it? Um, and so I, I, I think it's just such a, a, a beautiful um, approach that you have. And I, I, I love um, how you engage the sestina and the circularity of that. Um, in so many ways, we're kind of coming back to, you know, particular images and navigating pain in that way. Um, I think in my work, um, so fifth grade show and tell was one of the very first poems I wrote about um, El Salvador and my family. Um, for a long time, there had been so much silence in my family around um, El Salvador at all. Um, I didn't realize that my family had fled a war until I was 19, um, mm -hmm. right? And so part of it is the challenge with you know, um, explaining these histories was speaking about these histories, right? My grandmother told me that she fled because of the rain, because how else do you explain war to a six-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. And something that um, I think poetry has allowed me to do um, just really as a person is to sit with those moments, to tap into those memories, to, you know, think about What's my relationship to these stories? Um, a lot of stories which 
have, you know, gone unspoken um, or have been really, really painful to recount um, and trying to construct my own memories and my own personal archive through, you know, this work. Um, and certainly it's been a beautiful journey, um, although not an easy one, um, mm. to navigate um, kind of this search for an archive, the search for stories um, through the, these poems. Uh, and that's definitely helped me feel closer to to my family, to my histories, um, even though it's it's such a complex process, right? I think that as a diasporic person, I'm often thinking about like the loss that suffered, right? When one is forced to flee, um, when, you know, as a second generation poet, um, how do we recover some of these histories and how do we find our own engagement with them? Um, I think your work engages a lot of these, you know, themes in terms of like recovering stories and honoring family, um, grappling with the complexities of history. Um, for example, your poem for my mother ends with a thought, a bird begins with me still wondering what part of you I lose each day to another language, another song. So I would love to hear you speak more about, you know, like how does poetry help you connect to your family's histories and experiences? Thank you for that question. I'm also like very moved that you quoted from that poem because um, as I'm sure you remember, I'm right just before publication, I suddenly had a um, crisis about form with that poem and I sent you two versions <laughs> and just thought, oh my God, Janelle, which is better? So, um, it's you know, it's so moving to be kind of um, talking about these poems that in a way um, have been collaborative in some way and, and that your eyes have been so important. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. I think when I first started writing, um, I would try and kind of put thoughts together about things, not very well, <laughs> about kind of love or grief or friendship. And something that um, I didn't expect is that inexplicably, like the Atlantic Ocean would just turn up in the middle of my poems. It was like, I was trying to talk about something that had nothing to do with diaspora. And there it was, the sea. <laughs> and there would always be kind of a plane flying or um, a boat. And it actually made me, you know, it really was kind of a shock to me. And it made me think about just how much of my life has been spent with the sadness of having the ocean between the UK and Mexico. And, um, and feeling also that I leave always half of myself on the other side of the ocean. And I kind of really loved, um, I, I think before then I hadn't grasped kind of the effect of that imaginatively, physically, psychologically. And I loved what you were saying about um, kind of the stories that your grandma told you as a child and how do you communicate things as a child? Because after this kind of shocking discovery of like, I can't get away from the Atlantic Ocean, I talked to my mom about, I was just like curious about what, um, I don't know, like just what I was like as a, ch as a kid. And she was saying that actually all we talked about when she took me to preschool and like picked me up and, you know, um, those like intimate special times is all, all we would do is talk about Mexico. And I was like, as a little kid being like, you know, how is Sandra and how's Eto and how's Luzma? And so she would then tell me the stories of her childhood. And it was kind of these ways in which she would, I guess, from like you know, my, my very first memories and, and kind of almost pre-verbal, you know, as a baby, what she would do is tell me the stories of her childhood and the stories of her world. Um, and it's interesting because now obviously I'm in the US and I'm thinking about being yet again an ocean away from the UK. I'm like, I can't, whatever I do, I can't, I'm one side or the other and and always people I love are on the other side and what that means. Um, so anyway, that has been something thing that was kind of really interesting. And I think um, I have actually also a, um, a kind of nonfiction book that is coming out in September. And that has kind of an ethnographic archival um, component. And partly um, it was interesting how research began to open things that had been difficult for my family to think about and how, how, how it's so much easier sometimes to keep boxes shut and when it's possible to open them. And I'm just thinking about kind of you discovering about kind of your family fleeing the war when you were 19. It's so interesting, like in which mode and how that kind of is, can be really shocking to kind of re reconstruct everything you thought you knew. Um, and I'm just wondering, 
in terms of this subject, we've kind of been touching about possibilities. I was wondering whether you could maybe speak of the role of language and poetry in imagining a different world. You know, you were given this flight from rain as a child and and then your opening poem um, in another life really thinks about that, but also the imagined portrait of my father and your ending poem that you talked about before. I was just wondering whether maybe that was something you could speak to. Oh. Um, well, first I've got to say, we are so lucky to get two more Maya Elsner books in the world. Um, and I can't wait to, to read them. And I think especially, um, you know, to think about how, how much bigger these stories are, right. And how, how much, um, there is to say and explore about them, um, and using those different forms to access the work. Right. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, as far as um, kind of the imaginative qualities of poetry, I think for me is where I find poetry to be the most healing, mm -hmm. um, at least in my experience. Um, I wrote in another life after a year of um, actually doing a lot of research in El Salvador and um, kind of witnessing firsthand um you know, the, the aftermath of the war and getting to speak to people. And, um, one particular, um, memory that I have that always stuck with me was, um, my parents and I went to visit in Mosote, which was the site of, um, one of the most atrocious massacres in Latin American history in modern Latin American history. Um, and there was so much visceral pain about being there. Um, and I was trying to kind of grapple with that. Um, the first line that came to me was, Mozote does not mean massacre, right? And that I took that as a prompt. So I kind of asked myself, what would it take for that sentence to be true? For Mozote not to be linked with, with that massacre, um, for that massacre to not have happened. And I kind of worked my way back from there. And I thought, well, then the war wouldn't have happened. Well, if the war didn't happen, my parents wouldn't have migrated, which means that I wouldn't exist, right? And so that that's kind of some of the logic that was like, no, I'm still going to exist. The diaspora is still going to exist. Our you know experiences are important, but kind of trying to undo these histories of violence um, within a poem and replace them with so much fullness, with with um, you know, uh, uh, just abundance, right? Um, especially in a context um, of scarcity. Um, and I think that that was something that really let me use poetry in a totally different way than I had before. Um, that poetry is something that can honor and archive and document, that it's also something that um, can be liberatory in the way that, that it allows us to imagine. Um, and I think that liberation is so important in terms of how we resist, right? Um, and I know your work um, does such a beautiful job of um, kind of participating in that like wider lineage of, you know, Latin American women's resistance. And I wonder um, how you see your poetics engaging with, with that lineage. Well, I mean, I love this question, of course, but I also um, just feel so privileged that we're having this conversation. I feel like we've spoken so much <laughs> by email and meeting and Zoom. And I always just feel like, Janelle, all I want to do is talk to you for the rest of my life. And um, <laughs> I even opened a notebook the other day to see two uh, letters that I had begun to you and hadn't finished. And I was like, oh, I'm writing to Janelle. <laughs> so anyway, that was so funny. But um, anyway, I, in terms of yeah, in terms of resistance, I always think about kind of um, how damaging silence can be. And um, we've thought about that, um, kind of touched on it in this in this um, conversation. And just also about the long history of resistance to silence um, in the face of atrocity, especially by women. And I think this book really um, kind of is for me a cry against disappearance in a way um, of stories, of languages, of communities, of places of safety. And I think there's something around the collective that is really important here, a kind of collective resistance through a dialoguing, um, through action, um, and which is partly why it's very beautiful to be speaking here, to be collective with you. Um, and one thing I've been thinking about more recently is um, I've, I've kind of, I have, I'm currently kind of working on a project um, that uses the choose your own adventure kind of um, frame 
to think about the multiple possibilities that exist in each moment of interaction. And par partially it's kind of doing a speculative job. Um, as so many people, you know, have really thought about kind of um, the power of speculation, um, especially in terms of rescuing life from archive and um, especially when there's so little information and um, the only thing that's really recorded is a death. And I, I love what you were saying about kind of what would it be? How would you rearrange the world so that, um, you know, this place of massacre would not mean massacre for that not to be a meaning associated? Um, and so in thinking of alternative possibilities, um, I also you know, it, it's partly a way to think, to reimagine what interactions could be like and what structures would be like necessitated to make those interactions possible and what what we could be as, as human beings, as people who are involved in the practice of living in the praxis of living. Um, so that's something that I think is always with me in the way that we stand on the backs of um, all these people who have given so much and also about, in the end, the role of love, how what we do is out of love. and. Um, how anger is so important, but it's also anger and love together. Um, yeah. And I feel like it's it's in it's in that action that um, voices are the most powerful, um, and that something can really be enabled. Um, so talking about love, um, I love how your book is is also kind of a tribute to all the invisible behind the scenes work that is done often, I mean, always by women actually. And I'm thinking specifically about before the interview and to the eldest daughter. And I know that, you know, your academic work is also you're doing a PhD in UCLA. And I know so much of that is about community and poetry. And I was wondering whether, um, you know, that that was something that you wanted to maybe touch on. Um, um, I always feel like, um, you know, as I reflect on, on my journey, on the, the possibilities that my life has been full of and, and continues to be full of, um, there's, you know, this great sense of, of how fortunate I am and, and how grateful I am to get to live this life of, of reading and writing and, and thinking with people. And, um, I know that that has not been without sacrifice. And I know that that has, you know, never been on its own. Right. So certainly an important thing that, you know, just in my ethic as a human being um, is to acknowledge how people, other people have made my, my journey possible. Right. And dedicating myself to, um, you know, work that serves community, right. That thinks about, you know, how does poetry move people? How does poetry transform the way that we engage, um, you know, our, ourselves, our stories, um, each other's stories, um, particularly when we're, we're dealing with, as we've, you know, discussed, um, contexts of, of silencing con pain, um, and not letting those, you know, contexts define us, right? I love what you were saying earlier about um, you know, anger is important, but so is love and so is joy um, and kind of the speculative aspects of like what things can hold for us. Um, and so I'm always, you know, moved by how we can allow, you know, those possibilities into our work and how we can create poetry or engage poetry that that is is beyond us, right? Um and I do really believe in in the power of poetry in that way. So, yeah, it's so beautiful to get to talk to you about all of this. <laughs> I was actually wondering, um, I don't know whether you would like to read a poem of yours, whether that would be something. We haven't done that during this call, but I, I, would, I feel like I'd love to hear one if you wanted to. Well, I would love to hear you read a poem, too. <laughs> the way to, 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 yeah, just to share our work. Um, let's see. Sorry, I feel like I put you a little bit on the spot, but I suddenly was like, oh, I can't get to the end of a conversation with Janelle without hearing a poem. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what's the, what's the vibe? What are we feeling? Um, <laughs> you know what? I'll read, I'll read this poem that I very rarely do read. Um, and I wrote it um, right in the thick of, of lockdown. Um, it was one of the last poems to be added to this, this chapbook. Um, so the poem is called Instead of Producing. Papaya needed peeling, needed its skin slit along its sides to release the bitter of its milk, needed to spend hours sweetening in the sun, needed to be cut open 
for its seeds needed saving to turn solve for the stomach, and its flesh needed time to turn a deeper orange, which needed to be served into bowl and be bitten, needed to nourish the body whose hair needed braiding, and the body whose song needed listening to, and the body who had not had a thing to eat yet, and the body who had spent all day tending to patients, the body whose legs needed stretching, whose feet needed another's fingers to walk along their soles until the aching stopped, the body whose arms needed flour, water, salt, because bread needed to become, needed to rest so it could rise and bake, and once ready, bread needed to be centered, needed the company of other foods, needed a family to gather around and behold its being, bowing their heads in thanks for this blessing. Thank you so much, Janelle. Thank you, Maya. Now I'd love to hear a poem <laughs> from you. If you okay, could raise us with, it, with, with your words. <laughs> um, you know what? It's so nice, that poem you just read. I remember when it arrived in my inbox. I think you just, <laughs> I think you'd just written it and you were just yeah. like, and um yeah and I remember just being like this is perfect <laughs> when can I see it in print when can I have it in my hand <laughs> um okay I think so then to end maybe I'll read the the poem that I read a very old poem maybe the oldest in this collection now I'm trying to find where it is um I'll read the poem um that I read in the South Bank Center event um oh. that we met at as a kind of um thank you also to just thank you for your friendship Janelle it's been so moving and so special to me and continue to be and I cannot wait for all, all the sharing ahead so this one's called On Not Translating Neruda um, it has an epigraph um, from Pablo, Pablo Neruda es verdad que el ámbar contiene las lágrimas de las sirenas and um, the translation um, by William O'Daly which was um, right next to this this kind of poem um, from Gestiones um, when, I, when I first encountered it is is it true that amber contains the tears of mermaids before translation, the reflexive speaks of intimacy. Palms pressed, a child finding her own fingertips, a sunset stumbled on the years inside tomorrow when es verdad is both question and statement. The taxonomer translates, contiene as contains. Then caught up, he overlooks a figure passing, gloves clasped, clutching fragility in a glance that tears itself in translation, now hard, now cold. But in Spanish, con signifies with, as in contigo en una noche estrellada, contigo hasta la luz del día se suicida, bajo una ola morada, enamorada. He misses the difference between contains and holds. Will he contain his lover? Will he hold his lover's tears? Will he grasp closeness in another language? Um, thank you for the closeness of this conversation, Janelle. Thank you, Maya. Um, and thank you to everyone who um, has tuned in to listen to our conversation. Thank you so much. And that concludes episode one to season two of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. Please join us in a couple of months on Tuesday, April 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern time for episode two, which will feature a conversation between poets Andres N. Ordorica and Christopher Soto. Please register on the Writer Center's website to attend the premiere. Until then, I'm Brent Amanero, a 2022-2023 Poetry Coalition Fellow speaking on behalf of Letras Latinas. Thank you for joining us.